So far, we've been walking from fort to fort, only briefly touching on the subjects of the Vallum Wall and the Vallum Ditch, mainly because very little of either exists today along this stretch of the walk. Well, that's soon to change, so let's now acquaint ourselves with both. From this aerial view, we can clearly see the footprints of both the Vallum Wall and Ditch, even after 1900 years. The distance between forts along the wall varied between 5 and 7 miles, approximately. Space between the forts are smaller fortified enclosures, which we call mile castles, simply because they are more or less one Roman mile apart. Space between each set of mile castles are two interval watchtowers. And to the south of this primary line of defence lay the secondary line of defence, the Vallum Ditch. And running in between these two lines of defences, from fort to fort, would have been the Roman military road. All of which may have looked something like this shortly after completion. Now, most parts of the wall were constructed 10 feet wide, but this particular section, well, that's been constructed just 7 feet wide. But still, quite impressive. Let's take a look at the construction of the Vallum Wall and Ditch in cross section. Its construction did vary along the wall, as each section was built by Roman centurions of different legions. The outer ditch or trench would have been about 18 feet wide and 9 feet deep. Next would have been the burn, a plateaued area at the base of the Vallum wall. The wall's foundations are probably between 4 to 6 feet deep, which would have been sufficient to support a height of about 16 to 20 feet. The Vallum had a central ditch which could have been about 9 feet deep, whereas the two mounds either side may have reached a height of 7 feet or above. The berm sections had a width of about 28 feet, whilst the mounds were looking at 18 to 20 feet wide. So in all, the Vallum ditch would have had a width in excess of 100 feet. We know the Vallum ditch was built sometime after the wall and the forts were constructed, and, as is always the case, there are archaeologists and other scholars who will speculate as to its true purpose. Well, for my two penneth worth, this is a classic military response to an act or a period of insurgency by the indigenous population. From Vindabala, it was a nice leisurely seven mile stroll onto the fort of Unum at Haltonchester's. Once again, today there exists no visible remains for us to see or explore. Although not unique, we do know the fort differed to others along Hadrian's Wall. It is thought that the fort was built to ensure the even spacing of forts along the wall, but having said that, it did guard the Roman road, Deer Street, which lay half a mile away to its west. So what was all that different? Well, when it was first constructed, it didn't really follow the classic playing card layout. In fact, it was almost a square, measuring some 440 feet north to south and 400 feet east to west. What's more, during its 300 years of use by the Romans, its shape changed as a result of an extension to the southwest corner, giving it an unusual L shape. Another building of importance 
is the Praetorium, the personal residence of the Praetor, the fort's commanding officer. As a general rule, the Praetorium is located next to the Principia and fronting the Via Principalis, the road running east to west through the fort. The Praetorium was the building which offered all the comforts of Rome, but did vary in size and amenities in all the forts along the wall. Whilst it was the Praetor's personal residence, he would have shared it with other senior ranking officers and their personal slaves, but as Praetor, he and his family certainly reserved the lion's share. It's also the one building most likely to have a hypercourse heating system. So let's take a look at it. The foundations beneath the rooms intended to be heated had to be dug out and made deeper. In this case, the bathhouse and the main hall. Then a series of pillars of stone or brick would be built. Alternatively, perhaps because the floor above may have to support additional weight, several rows of stone walls may be built instead. These stacks were known as pillae. Also note that the builders created stone arches within the foundations and that the rows of stone walls were actually freestanding. They didn't connect with the main foundations. At about this stage of construction, the builders would then have set in place a series of ceramic box tubes known as hypercost flue tiles. These would have been made by the legion's own craftsmen and as the height of the wall increased, more would be added and eventually encased within the wall's plaster render. Their function was twofold. They helped to draw the hot air through the system and in turn would heat up the walls. Next. Thick stone flags would have been mortared in place on top of the pile. All of which would then be sealed by a thick layer of concrete. And it's to this layer that a finished surface such as marble or tesserae would eventually be applied. The box flue tiles stacked on top of each other and encased behind the plaster render would also have extended above the roof line allowing smoke to exit the outside of the building. So why don't we now watch the system in action? With the furnace now lit and well ablaze, thick black smoke and hot air begins to flood the void beneath the bathhouse. Rapidly it overflows into the chamber below the main hall, being drawn and then hungrily sucked up into the ceramic tubes. And all this is happening unseen beneath the floor of the bathhouse and main hall. But had we passed this point at Unum Fort 1800 years ago and seen the smoke billowing from the Praetorium, we would have known it was bath night for someone. <laughs> 